Medical engineering has come a long way in the turn of the century. For many years, people with physical disabilities struggled to find prosthetics that were both practical and economical. 3D printing is changing this, however, and patients no longer need to compromise when obtaining a purposeful prosthesis. At Bright Founders Talk, we had an opportunity to chat with the founder of the medical device company, a speaker, Mario Aspinoda. This episode is a worthwhile listen for anyone interested in learning about the fascinating world of bioengineering. Hi everyone and welcome to Bright Founders Talk at Tami. Tami is an international software development company that designs, builds and delivers software for sustainable businesses and promising startups. I'm happy to introduce our today's guest, Mario Espinoza, founder of A Speaker. Hello, Mario. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good too. Thank you that you find time to join us today. We will discuss a lot of important topics today, of course. But first of all, we want to get more information about you, your personality. Uh, according to the LinkedIn, um, you've been working in the industry for a long time. Why did you actually choose biomedical and electrical engineering? Well, that's 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 a really interesting question. Um, I was born in Peru, uh, but I grew up in Costa Rica. My family is mm -hmm. from Italy and Spain, and I've been living in Portugal for the last 12 years. So I'm kind of like all around the place. Uh, mm -hmm. When I was 17 years old, I just happened to be in Costa Rica. And when I was there, uh, they didn't have biomedical engineering, but my mother's family, they are all doctors and my dad's family, they are all engineers. So I kind of like both things. And mm -hmm. I, I just, yeah, I found out that there was this new field called biomedical engineering and they were doing like the merge of those two things. And it was really interesting for me. I wanted to study that. Um, they didn't have that career in Costa Rica. So I, you know, next best thing was electrical engineering. Uh, I major with like I'm legally I could sign uh -huh. plans for like big substation industry uh, stuff like that. I I, I would never do that. <laughs> it's like really dangerous for me. <laughs> but the engineering part did help me a lot to understand a lot of concepts. For furthermore, when I was doing my master's, it was already. I, I got a scholarship to, to come here to Europe to study my master's in biomedical, and mm -hmm. then I study my PhD in biomedical engineering as well. So okay. it was kind of like a far fetch from where I started to where I ended up, but it was all like family stuff. My, I, mm -hmm. I, it was close to me, both the medical part and the engineering part. Okay, that's surprising, honestly. Uh, and what is your motivation to continue your career in this sphere? I find it very challenging. Like mm -hmm. when you apply engineering to something that it's good for people, I I find it kind of enthusiastic and it, it helps not only deliver the best of you, but also makes the best of the people come out. Mm -hmm. Like if you can empower someone that is not walking to walk again, then you're making him or her a, like more him <laughs> i don't know how to say that in english it's like they're becoming more themselves like you can help them become more themselves and I, mm -hmm. it's still them it's just the best of them that's that's the part that i like um personally i really like the idea of doing something that is like not only good for people not only good for mankind but also you know i, I must confess i like the part of there is there is like a true market there. There is like a business purpose for this. Mm -hmm. But also has this, you can have, I feel like it's a part where you can have some type of legacy that it's uh, a whole thing. For example, when I used to work for Intel, we used to have this thing of you working on a small project of a wing of a plane that came in a carrier. So it was like sub, 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 sub systems. But with medical engineering, you have this, all this with startups, you have this ability to work on something where you see the whole picture and you can work on the whole thing and what. Mm -hmm. So I really like the opportunity of having this, how you want to steer the ship 
as opposed to just being constricted to this really small space of what you're supposed to be working in. And that's why I love startups. I, I have to confess that's, I love making impossible things real. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I have also noticed from your LinkedIn that you had an opportunity to be a director in the Latin American University of Science and Technology. What were yes. your responsibilities? Did you have like classes with students? Uh, well, not really, because this was during the pandemic. So mm -hmm. it was kind, mm -hmm. of, kind of difficult, but it was the first biomedical engineering school in the whole Central America. Mm -hmm. So they just created it. They needed someone from biomedical engineering. At the time, we were six biomedical engineers in Costa Rica, all studied abroad, because mm -hmm. as I mentioned, you, there was no school there. So I just happened to be there because I was, <laughs> I was with a pandemic. <laughs> I couldn't move, so I wasn't stuck in Costa Rica until we got the vaccines. So I just thought it was like a really nice thing mm -hmm. to do. Um, the know-how that I have, is something that I could apply there and you know just give something back. That's that's how I, I thought of it. And it was a really interesting thing. We had like 400 students. So there were a lot of people just yes. massively <laughs> joined that program. Yeah. So um, we started from zero. So I, I saw a bit like a startup venture thing. Mm -hmm. It was starting from zero. So we needed to find the professors, we needed to make sure the curriculum was you know, the courses you're taking are in the correct order, are the right things, what topics you are seeing in each one of them. Um, and then administrative administrative things like, you know, people coming in, I want to take this instead of that, or I have a problem here, or, you know, whatever. But mainly it was what type of softwares we need to buy, because they really didn't have that. Um, who are we going to talk to? Which industries we're going to take from, in partnership with? How are we going to get people that have good ideas, how we're going to spin them off, like creating these um, technology transfer units so we can spin off things that we were creating or investigating. It was, it was a real nice project. I really liked it. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Uh, I see and I can say more that I'm confident that you are passionate about your work. I can see from our conversation. Uh, so uh, do you think in the future about the mentoring someone or uh, like be a teacher, be a professor in the universities? I would love to. I would love to, but I really like the industry as well. Like, mm -hmm. I, I couldn't see myself just being in academia. I really like the idea of, of, of industry. But I love the idea also of mentoring because I that's something I always lacked. Like, when I was growing up professionally, mm -hmm. I couldn't have that, that one guy or that one girl <laughs> that I could look up to and say, oh, I want to mm -hmm. be like that. Because there just wasn't until I arrived here in Europe. And even when I arrived here, um, people were like on their own and we didn't have that thing of well we're studying this because eventually we want to take something to the market it was like we're studying this because this is science this is good this is good for mankind this is good for everyone but not that like pushing to let's get products outside let's actually make this see work in the real life it was really especially with a PhD you can imagine mm -hmm. that and people go very much into in research and development but not that little step further that I really like, which is making it available for people, having it like in your hands already with doing what it's supposed to be doing. This is the thing, <laughs> it's supposed to be doing something. So you better deliver it to people and mm -hmm. you better make it appealing and it should have that, um, well, we call that a lot now, U UI, UX, that user experience. It has to be appealing. It has to be something they want to try, they want to use. and. When you combine what is good for the patient, but it's affordable, and I mean in the whole sense of the thing, like mm -hmm. you can really make it like a business case out of it. And when it actually has a purpose, it's it's just wonderful. It, it just works, it works like a clock. It's, I, I don't know, I love it. <laughs> it's something very special. Oh, this is great. I want to talk uh, now more about Adaptar. You've been working there for five years. Adaptar is a UK biomedical innovation company that brings uh, new smart technologies to the operations and procedures market. Uh, what exactly smart solution does Adaptar bring to the market? 
Okay, well, Adaptech we started out in 2015 with my business partner, uh, Fred, mm -hmm. Rico in Portuguese, but Fred for, <laughs> for, for everybody else. <laughs> uh, so what we saw was something really special. And this is this is the thing I love about biomedical my med engineering. So you know how you have these super alloys of titanium and space grade materials and everything like that for prosthetics. And you have these carbon blades and how they like curved ones, the ones mm -hmm. people use for running, and you know, they take all the energy back from the ground and they just push people and you can run, you can dance, you can do whatever you want, and they have these microelectronics and super sensors and rah! Everything is super high tech until the part that goes into the stump. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so for all that technology that you have, that space era technology, you have exactly the same procedure for connecting it to, for engaging it to the to the memory mm -hmm. to the procedural limb as it was five hundred years ago. So it's it's pirate technology. It's pirates of the Caribbean thing. I mean, America wasn't even discovered, and we still use the same procedure, which is casting a mold creating something out of it and just trying to go just like this well, mm -hmm. choop, and try to get it inside. And it's really primitive. It's really artisanal. That's the word. You have to be almost like a kind of sculpture to make it right. And it's very subjective and it takes a lot of time, a lot of trial and error. And we came out with this idea, which is what if we are able to see what happens between the stump and the socket? So we had this idea of placing some serotors inside and getting this scanner that goes into the socket and out mm -hmm. of it. And it's going down, it scans the socket and knows where the places of the sensors are. And that creates a map of everything. So when the patient actually wears the prosthesis, we have like a distribution map mm -hmm. of how the pressure is going inside. So there's now the prosthetist, which is the guy that actually makes the prosthesis, they can see what's happening and they can make the proper adjustments according to what they are seeing. So it's like, works like an x-ray. It's, it's kind of interesting. <laughs> so you are uh, one of the co-founders of Adaptech, am I right? Yes. Yes. So uh, did you have, if we come back to the 2015, did you have any doubts before the launching such big business? Well, I think doubt is healthy. Like, you know, it's going to happen, but having some type of, just some level of fear is good because it keeps you in guard. Like mm -hmm. you wouldn't get this hoover. So <laughs> this is a piece of cake. Well, of course it's going to happen. <laughs> you need to have that, that small ego check and confidence. Like, mm -hmm, okay, okay. This may not happen. So what we're mm -hmm. going to do? Especially because you never know what, what is going to happen. So you just... You just never know. <laughs> like mm -hmm. some things happen, and that you cannot, mm -hmm. you cannot foresee. Nobody foresaw the pandemic. Nobody foresaw that thing coming. Yes, exactly. Like, how do you prepare for that? And and that's 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 exactly the type of things that you need to keep in the back of your mind, and so it will not catch you completely on guard. Luckily for me, I had a, a business partner, so he took over everything and. But it was really difficult at the time. And it meant like a lot of effort from everyone to just step in and cover all the functions that I was doing, all the jobs that had to be done was, you know how a startup is, is like jumping off a cliff and trying mm -hmm. to build an airplane before you hit the ground. So or <laughs> it's really difficult when, when something like this happens. Either way, the important part for me was that having confidence that you're gonna do it while maintaining a simple level of just upkeeping and like being able to know what might happen is is very good. It's, it's really good. You, you need that motivation along the way because it's up and down. Sometimes mm -hmm. you're gonna be really low. Sometimes you're gonna feel like you can do whatever. It's like sending someone to the moon. Yeah, sure, I'll do it next week. And then you, oh my God, we have no money. What's going to happen? Uh, <laughs> I have to, I'll have to get everyone to go to their home and it's, it's really difficult. So I think like a um, healthy level of skepticism, healthy level of, of paranoia, just a little bit, it, it's good. It's good. 
What do you find the most difficult part in the doing business in your industry? I think that's very regional dependent. So, for example, raising money in Portugal for hardware is really hard. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, raising money in Costa Rica is near impossible. And raising money in France is not the same as raising money in Germany or Ukraine. So it, it varies a lot depending on where you are. Some people are very apprehensive on hardware, especially hard, if, especially Portugal. And then on top of that, it's not only hardware, it's medical hardware. So it has that extra layer of difficulty because of you know all the certifications, C mm -hmm. marking, FDA, ISO 13485, which is the medical device directive. And, you know, like like a thousand things you have to take in mind. So it just gets keeping getting harder. But I don't think that there is like something common for the whole thing. So there are some specifics out of each one. Mm -hmm. So if you want to raise money in the UK, it's no longer part of the European Union. So mm, there are some things. You want to raise money in Portugal? Oh, yeah, we have a lot of money and a lot of money for Portugal is one million. Which for the Swiss, one million is like, ooh, I have that in my wallet. Like, ooh, don't come to me for that little money. <laughs> Talk to me when you need a hundred million. And <laughs> yeah, I know. So I think one of the best things you can do as founder is having to try this eclectic, eclectic approach of going to find what you need in different places. Mm -hmm. um, I say this not only in the sense of money, but also in the sense of industry. Like... For example, you know that we have very good engineers on Eastern Europe, especially software, mm -hmm. like guys, <laughs> and you can hire them and they are not going to be as expensive as UK engineers, which by the way, are not that good. <laughs> <laughs> like you can get a whole more for your money outside mm -hmm. of these places, or you can get some suppliers for some parts that come from Israel, or maybe they come from Turkey. Or you can outsource some things for, you know, Greece. You don't have to always think of, um, like the big players. Let's get everything from America because it's not necessary. You can, mm -hmm. can get more. You can be more efficient if you know where to find. Like you guys, you 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 will speak English. Like sure, I have interns yeah. from Ukraine actually, so I mm -hmm. really like having them because it it gives you another perspective. It's completely a different thing and. It also brings to the table something else. It's, it's not only it's not only diversity. It's not only a different point of view. It's not only a different alphabet. It's it's <laughs> it's the idea that they can bring a way of doing things that because of their background and because of the way they were raised, they have different forms of seeing solutions. And when you mix it, when you get that into the mix of the way the other people are thinking mm -hmm. it usually comes something better than just a plain sum of everything. It just like exponentially grows and becomes something massive and just fits, it just fits. And, and I really like that. Okay, uh, you've already mentioned somehow the topic which I uh, want to discuss also, it's about people. What is challenging to find your team members? According to my therapist, one of the things I look most in people, it's their character. So <laughs> let's start there. <laughs> my interview process, it's it's kind of sweet genities. <laughs> That's uh, like a very special type of process because I don't really care that much about what technical level they have. Like, mm -hmm. I, I don't give a shit about their grades or anything like that. Like, it just <laughs> means nothing to me. That Absolutely nothing to me. So people came here, oh, look at my grades. They are all A+. Plus. And I go, yeah, sure. <laughs> wow, woo. I'm, I'm really dumb and I also got good grades. So <laughs> just it doesn't balance out. And I have a very strict policy of only hiring people that are smarter than me. Very strict policy. They have to be smarter than me. Mm -hmm. I look for them <laughs> in my interviews. It's people that it's honest and can take the level of pressure that startup crushes. <laughs> like, just, like you're always in need. You always have to be like, do it like, you know, like grammar style. You only have like half a kilo of meat and you have to feed 50 people and somehow they do it. Mm -hmm. that, that magic is what I'm looking for. I'm looking at that attitude, that 
that capacity of doing something that seems impossible and do it. And I ask them questions that are really hard. And starting because I, I get to the room like Guantanamo style. I, I get it to 16 degrees. I have uncomfortable chairs. Light is always hidden on them, like, you know, interrogation room. And <laughs> I sit down and I start doing technical questions, which I don't give nothing. I, I, I just don't care what they are answering. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. And all of a sudden, you have you ever peed in the shower? And <laughs> And that kind of question is really tricky <laughs> because <laughs> if they say no, they are lying. Like everybody has peed in the shower. Who doesn't? <laughs> and if you say yes, nobody wants to admit that on a job interview. It's like weird. Like, but the people that say yes is the people I like <laughs> because I know they are being honest with me at that point. Mm -hmm. I know that they have that. I know that if they can handle the how uncomfortable they are feeling with this type of questions they will be also comfortable dealing with the uncomfortable parts of being in a startup you know mm -hmm. always running out of money always running out of time there are no work hours everybody's trying to do whatever they can it's like always trying to put down a fire it's always somewhere a burner there's always something to do it's it's a ship that it's sinking and everybody has a bucket and it has to take water out of it before it goes to the bottom and and i need people to have that that feeling Mm -hmm. I have seen from other interviews, interviews, inter people I interview, they usually have that two sides. Either they want like a big company and have that certainty and they want to make sure that they have the they have their social security, they're going to always have their paycheck, they are always going to have where to park their car, everything is going to be from eight to five PM, like very stable things. And that's something I cannot get. So the interview process for me goes both ways. So it's really important for them to also understand mm -hmm. how we play and how it's going to be on our side. As for me, is to see how they are playing. And once again, it's, it's a type of honesty that I'm really looking for. That way, we are not wasting their time. They are not wasting ours. And it just flows. Like, I have no problem in saying, no, no, you know what? You're a crazy guy. I just, uh, bye. And sure, perfect. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> I have no problem with that at all i really respect it for people that go no i cannot deal with the idea that today i have a job and tomorrow i may not so no this is not for me and all of a sudden you have these guys that go, yeah i'll do it and those are my guys <laughs> honestly uh your style uh is uh maybe it's crazy but i like it because you know when you are going to the labor market all of the companies they want from you some kind of certification some kind of experience and everyone wants the experience and if you have no experience if you are just postgraduate student uh you have no opportunity to work to start somewhere and it's great I that you... like completely i couldn't care less i have hired mm -hmm. tons of people that haven't even finished college like they are still in their last years or something i i, I just don't care I just don't care because the technical side you can learn. Mm -hmm. It's not something you you learn. It's something you develop develop along the years. It depends on how your life has been and the things you have been through, and that character that forms is what it's really important. There are things you know. Google it. You'll find it. This is not. A... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I like it. Something different. It's something different. I, I look something different in their personality. I look mm -hmm. for for creativeness i like i like for them to know how to work under pressure i like for them to i like for them to feel like being challenged is not something bad but rather takes the best of them out like they are forced to do something great and they feel comfortable with doing something great and although mm -hmm. maybe not the best way they actually get there you know I, i'm very apologistic of of having given the third best because the second best arrives too late and the first best never arrives. So I just want that sweet spot of people being able to come up with a solution works. Okay, let's move forward. That's for me, that's the whole point of a startup. Like I know once you get to Coca-Cola levels, I know you're going to make fun of this Coca-Cola. That's how you pronounce it. When you get to Coca-Cola levels, <laughs> you have to have like big established processes and quality controls and you know the whole thing like mm -hmm. and everything has to be ta -ta 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 -ta, made and the line of production has to be this way uh, 
that when you're a startup and you're creating something that nobody has ever created before, what you need is speed of thought. Mm -hmm. You need to be able to think. You need to be able to know for sure that no system is better than its worst component. And I like to make sure that the worst component that we have in the system is what you are thinking. So it's not supposed to be your your tools. It's not supposed to be anything like that. It's supposed to be your imagination. The limit is really within you. So if you're able to break that limit and you're able to see solutions when nobody else is seeing them, that's 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 gold for me. That's that's the type of guys that I want. You are the founder of a speaker. Uh, could you please tell us in detail your idea and the goal? Yes. So, um, because of what I was working with with Adaptec, we met with a lot of people from prosthetic clinics, and they would <laughs> ask the same. So, can we do this scanner for upper limbs? And we said, like, well, no, because we're doing lower limbs, which are bigger, they are more concave, mm -hmm. they are darker, more reflective. So, you need like a scanner that goes inside and then goes outside, it uses lasers and projects some some lines that go deforming, and that's how you make the the, the map, the three D model. But it just kept at the back of my mind. Like there was something with upper limbs. Mm -hmm. uh, so doing some research, research, I I just find out there is there is no upper limb like hand scanners. You have very nice precision scanners for machinery and stuff like that, but it's for big objects, and they don't have this thing of like on concave and convex and concave, convex and concave. Mm -hmm. That's why all the hand scans you see, you will see hands like this. They are never like in a natural position when because when they do it like this, it becomes like like a dog, uh -huh. dog feet. They have like membrane here. So it's really difficult. Um, you need someone to go there and then clean the whole thing up and it, they cost like 25,000 euros. It's like complex process. Once again, the way that people are doing cosmetic prosthesis nowadays is you go to the clinic, they take them all out of you, they make a mold out of the mold, they make another mold, <laughs> this one in metal, then they deposit like silicon inside mm -hmm. over and over, so it becomes like layer, like a lasagna, and then it goes to an artist that, you know, paints it and gets nail and gets even hairs, like amazing work, amazing work, mm -hmm. it's really a piece of art, and they, they deliver the hand to you, you only have to pay 15,000 euros. <laughs> exactly <laughs> exactly you get a lamborghini you get a lamborghini but you have to pay fifteen thousand euros so you have the complete extremes you either have like this super high-end hyper realistic piece mm -hmm. or you have nothing or you know the hook rrr, like pirate stuff like mm -hmm. you go by to pirate stuff so i don't want to be on either side i want to be somewhere in the middle like not a Lamborghini, not going by foot. Like there must be some Volkswagen Polo here that you can use. And that's how we came up with this. We have this scanner that is able to scan hands and we can send that information to 3D print on a, on a SLA, last year's mm -hmm. intersection printer. And it just becomes available in one hour with the color of the patient. And you know, you can have as many as you want and it's going to be just a few hundred euros instead of thousands. So. It, the idea that you have to be like this for over months before they come to you, you just print it. You mm -hmm. just print it and then you have it. And if for some reason one day it's raining and you're, I don't know, you got it dirty or you're passing on newspapers or maybe like jeans and it becomes blue, then you are not ruining 15,000 years of work. You just change it and have a new one. Because they only last like a couple of years because of the wear and tear, you know, our hands are very, we use everything with our hands. What stage of implementation of all of your plans are you on what stage? Right now, like the, the 3D printing part, it's already done. Like there are some guys, I think this is Prusa, this guy in Czech. He's like my age, 30 something, like he's a genius. And he already has these 3D printers that are already in the market. They work perfectly. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. It's already there. What we don't have is the scanner and the algorithms for reconstruction. Mm -hmm. The algorithms for reconstruction is something that we already know because we kind of know how to reconstruct things. <laughs> we have this idea of what we need as an input so we can make the output, which is the 3D model. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. We feel very comfortable with it, uh, especially because the more scans you get, you will run with, you know, some artificial intelligence on the side. So the more scans, the better it gets, the better it gets, the better it gets. And the scanner itself, the hardware, uh, that's my business partner now, which is uh, Joan, which means John in Portuguese. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Johnny. <laughs> so Johnny is it's a mechanical engineer and he's big. he has super genius ideas for, for stuff, like really, really special ideas for stuff. And they work really well. And he has this mechanical idea how to move the thing, the scanner, so we can get the whole hand with the whole points, like everything how it's supposed to be. Like from minimal things like the cameras, they have to be like striving, mm -hmm. like they have to be a bit, so they can really come overlap each other and see how, how the distances are, all the way to how the cables have to be placed. So we don't have the problem of when it's moving that you will trip on the cables, thermal considerations, electromagnetic compliance. It has to be fire retardant because it's a medical device. It has to be cleanable with alcohol. It, it has a lot of things, but Joao is it's that kind of guy that has all these things in his head when he's developing something. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel super relaxed that there is someone that actually knows how to make engineering in my team. Because to be honest, like uh, I'm a shitty engineer. I, 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 <laughs> <laughs> like I, I own a Mac. I, I don't I don't do engineering. <laughs> I really don't. <laughs> it's great to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> what I would think that is my greatest strength in this area is that I know when I'm not the right guy for doing something. So the moment I know there is someone that is better than me and doing something, that's the moment I hire that guy and that's the guy that is doing that. Not me, not anymore. Mm -hmm. I know, for example, that from some years now on, probably I won't be the CEO because it just, it's just not me. It's going to be someone else that knows how to play, uh, how to turn a 1 million company into a 20 million company. And then probably it's going to be another guy that knows how to turn a 20 million company into a 100 million company. But for me, my playground is going from paper, from ideas and napkins to something that you can touch and actually go into the market. Mm -hmm. that's, my, that's, that's my game. That's, that's what I do. And I do it with this army of people that are with the same mindset. Like, just let's do it. Let's do it. Like, they, <laughs> we have <laughs> They don't fuck around. You know? like, they do it. <laughs> the thing is doing it, and making it happen, making it happen. So we are moving to my last question. To sum up all of our discussion and the conversation, it would be great if you answer the question, uh, could you please share with us a piece of advice that can motivate our watchers, young entrepreneurs to start launching their business? You know, here in Portugal, a few weeks ago, they announced that they were making something called a unicorn factory. So everybody could join there. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah. This this is Lisbon, so man. <laughs> the unicorn factor. So everybody goes there, becomes a unicorn. And I was like, yeah, sure. Why didn't you make like a Maradona school? And everybody goes there and becomes a Maradona. You know, like <laughs> that's not the way it works. That's not the way it works. And I don't think it's something like ooh, only a few people have it in their hearts. No, I think it's just you need a fertile ground where your ideas can grow like that that's the proper thing you, you need that ground that baseline there is there is a story that always kept in my mind when i was a kid they, they told me this and i don't most likely it's not true but i really like the idea that it illustrates supposedly allegedly there was this second battalion of armor vehicles so all the tanks were crossing by america and vietnam like a hundred tanks going through the forest right so it's really hot in Vietnam. So they all have like the lid of the tank it was open. Mm -hmm. arr, arr, all the green goes going, arr, arr, crushing the whole forest. Arr. And this Vietnamese guy goes into one tree with a basket full of steaks. And each time <laughs> the tank passes, he grabs a steak, throws the snake boop, into the tank. Another tank, boop, another snake. A hundred meters later, the whole brigade of tanks, it's stopped. The tank is in stack is intact nobody touched it like they could use it <laughs> the solution costs like one euro per snake one guy stopped a whole brigade of tanks like 
you guys are doing something like that to the Russians. <laughs> we, just, we, we have seen that the tractor thing of yeah, I'm just taking the tech away. That's brilliant, you know, like that's the type of things, that is exactly the type of thing. That is a real entrepreneur. That's somebody who really knows how to think outside of the box and doing something amazing. Just like nothing, just a little bit of something and creates a lot of impact. I, I, I it's just that little, 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 little thing. That's that solution finding, that troubleshooting, it's it's <clears throat> that's that's what's magic. I mean, if there's some way you can apply that to everything you do, you start seeing everything like a startup venture and it just becomes richer in the form that you talk to people and the way you interact with your own colleagues and your own classmates becomes so, so much better because their input is not, it's not just another idea. It, it comes, it steams from some other, somewhere else. So you have that perspective as well. What, what it gives you is perspective. And that's mm -hmm. something that, that's why collaboration is so important. And that's why I feel people need to understand that the, the place where you create most impact is when you have your own solutions based on the background of a lot of people to be implemented on someone that really needs it. That that's For me, that's how it works. So you better understand really well what's the problem that you are dealing with. You really find out the solution that is not only yours because your ideas alone are like the greatest ever. You need someone to tell you, no, you're a dumbass. You need something else. <laughs> but those people that are telling you that is something that you need to trust. And there's somebody that have to see the ways in a different form. Otherwise, it's just like a cycle. And yeah, your idea is great. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's great. Oh, yeah. And it just, you know, it doesn't work anyway. It just doesn't work that way. It's not the way. Great, Mario. Thank you for sharing your story, for your thoughts. They are amazing. You're most welcome. <laughs>